Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending January 16th. First up, uh, this is from popularmechanics.com. A new efficient design could save the incandescent light bulb. Actually, if you listen to Science Friday like I do, the two authors of this study that created this super efficient incandescent bulb we're talking about that was not their purpose at all to replace um, LEDs and fluorescent with the new incandescent bulb. It was to study the effects of transference of energy and recapturing energy and converting it in different ways. So um, the article begins with uh, actually talking about the fact that they really believe this is you know something that's uh, for that purpose but it's not and uh, what it is is it's a first well I'll actually read the paragraph the first proof of concept device had a 6.6 percent .6 luminous efficiency as a measurement of how well its system converts energy into light compared to 2 to 3 percent efficiency for normal incandescent bulbs. CFLs have an efficiency between 7 and 15 and LEDs between 5 and 20 percent but the researching team thinks they can pr improve the method to build an incandescent bulb with 40 percent efficiency which would make it the most efficient light bulb on the market. Um, the findings which were recently published in Nature Nanotechnology provide further evidence that applications of novel photonic designs to old problems can lead to potentially new devices and what they're looking at themselves is they think the breakthrough may be that you can actually take thermal infrared energy and use it to uh, get more efficiency out of photo uh, voltaic, photovoltaic cells so instead of just the light spectrum from the light itself you can actually get a little bit of extra boost from the infrared energy and be able to um, convert that too so this is basically it's not it, the incandescent producing an incandescent bulb this efficient was just a way they could design something for their proof of concept design of energy uh, conservation on a nano scale and basically how this thing worked too is uh, some special sensors in this bulb would actually take the incandescent light um, that was uh, emitted and actually bounce it back into the actual little uh, element that's glowing to uh, keep it basically going over and over again and reusing itself and reconverting itself from heat back into light so that's the whole thing and that's the whole proof of uh, concept and if you want to if you go to sciencefriday.com and you can click on listen to the latest episode which I think it'll be posted up for about a week at least until next Friday then after that you'll have to go and search it in the archives you can actually hear them talk it's one of I think three or four subject topics they talked about and the guests, I don't think these were the only guys that worked on it. I won't even probably get these names right, but it's uh, one of them is Martin Soljesic, and the other one is Agnijan Illick. They were both um, guys that actually wrote out the paper um, about this project and everything. So they're two of the guys that worked on this new incandescent technology. So if you get a chance and you listen to Science Friday, if you have, you ever, you've already heard a little bit about it. But yeah, it's not quite the way popular popular mechanics. It kind of surprises me because usually popular mechanics, although they do kind of correct themselves later on into the article and say it's a proof of concept, but it's uh, it's not like these guys were uh, wanting to design something for consumers so we could get back to buying more incandescent bulbs. Even if they did get it up close to the same efficiency as an LED, what would really be the point? I mean, if you're just if you're not doing something better, but that was never their intent or purpose in the first place. So. This next one is from my friend 1954 Shadow Bob. This is from Wired Magazine. Astrophysicists may have found gravitational waves or not. Um, I don't think I've ever even talked about it maybe in the past, but this is the LIGO experiment. It's a Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Yeah, I know they left out the W, but whatever. And what it basically is, is there's two sets of tubes, one buried in Washington State and the other one buried in Louisiana State, and they're shaped like an L. And what happens is at the... Uh, well, if, if you envision this part is the L, envision this part is the L right here, they shoot a laser beam into this part and then split it two directions, and it's actually laying out on a horizontal plane is what it is. And by shooting these two light beams, laser light beams, down these tubes, and actually to make it longer, they bounce them back and forth over 70 times to give it more laser beam to possibly interfere with. If there really are gravitational waves, which there is indirect evidence, 1974, a pulsar measurements uh, in the two... I don't remember their names, but uh, I'll post one of the articles that has it in here. But two uh, uh, astronomers actually measured um, indirectly gravitational waves and got a Nobel Prize for doing it besides two. So there is uh, that indirect proof of what they want to do with the, the laser light is actually get direct proof and measure the waves themselves. And it's kind of interesting, this technique, what it does is it actually puts these two uh, in the L-shaped thing 
these two laser beams come back, but they don't come back at exactly the same time. They actually put them out of phase on purpose to where the lights cancels each other out. So at the end, when they go back, there's a little photo detector, and it actually, because they cancel each other out, there is actually no light appearing on this uh, photo detector. So what would happen if either one of these beams would get squished or stretched out as a result of gravitational waves hitting it one way rather than another? Because remember, these are an L shape, so any kind of wave form that hits it is going to hit it different on one than the other. It should actually either squish or stretch out one of the beams and by doing that in comparison to the other beam the photo detector should be able to actually detect at least a small amount of light now they also have to overcome things like uh, vibration and different things that can kind of put noise into the experiment and things like that so I guess what they did is they upgraded the detector in Louisiana and it's about four times better than it was before so they're still putting some good money into this and they're actually I think talking about putting some other experiments up to well you can look at the article and see I'm gonna give you the reference to the Wired magazine and also to the Wikipedia link about the uh, LIGO experiment but it's really interesting in a if we do actually, what the reason why there this is being talked about is just basically somebody actually put out some rumors. Uh, who was it that actually put the rumor out? This was Lawrence M. Krauss. My earlier rumor about LIGO has been confirmed by independent sources. That's what he says, but nobody's actually saying it. So uh, it could be somebody on the inside of the experiment has leaked something out that'll that'll come out a little bit later, but. Um, my thought is too with any experiment even if they really do believe they detected the gravity waves they're gonna check recheck and even recheck after that because so many times they've claimed to have discoveries and then find out it was just you know some random noise or something else um, interference introduced into the experiment or something like that so before they're gonna release it to the public they want to be absolutely absolutely positively sure and that's how you should do science and this last one, I'm just going to play a little bit of the video here. This was uh, posted in the Dumpster Divers, and this is from my friend Anthony M. The Bricky Wall Building Tool. And uh, this is kind of cool. As you watch I'm just going to play the video part, not the sound. And as you watch this, I think it's a really cool tool. Now, if you look at the original video on YouTube and then um, check out the comments down below, man, did they get a flame wars from professional bricklayers now. I don't believe anybody believes in their right mind if you're an intelligent person that you're going to get this bricky tool and you're all of a sudden going to go out and build your dream house out of bricks, not unless you're a professional bricklayer in the first place. Now, this is the kind of tool you would probably use or somebody like me that would use. This is not a professional bricklayer that I would use maybe to build a small barbecue, maybe some garden walls, uh, raised bed garden. Uh, Maybe even if you get a little bit ambitious, maybe before you even tackle something like a house, maybe see how good you would be at building a, a brick garden shed. But yeah, for some reason, these bricklayers got really offended by it. And I heard some some guys saying, well, uh, I can I can put bricks just as fast or faster than that bricklaying tool. And I don't need that. Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, you're a professional bricklayer, maybe with 20 years experience. So uh, yeah, sure, you're going to beat the average person like me. But hey, if this kind of little template deal makes life easier for me, you know, the few occasions I would be putting up bricks you know so why get so upset about it but yeah uh, I think if you realize the limitations of what it are what it what are the limitations of what it can do and what you're able to do I think it's absolutely fine I don't have a problem with it and I'll put a link below too there's also a full 30 minute infomercial I guess since they put out the original bricky which was uh, uh, not so adjustable they've got another bricky here that seems to come apart and uh, you can put it together in multiple different pieces and configurations to do different kinds of concrete blocks and different widths of walls and stuff like that too so I don't know if you would call it a bricky deluxe but they call it a bricky new and this was uh, from August of 2013 so if you get a chance it's a it's it's a pretty decent 30 minute infomercial and you know for what it's uh, what its limits are I think it's a great thing so anyway I think that's about long enough for this week take care everybody I will catch you next week